while we were singing that. Because, you know, people love to complain about politicians, right? You can transform that. When they're saying, I can't believe what they're doing. These idiots in Sacramento. Blah, blah, blah. You just say, okay, let's pray for them right now. That'll either shut them up or change the conversation. <laughs> it's a win-win. So um, that or they'll never complain in front of you again. But Scripture commands us to pray for our politicians, to pray for those in leadership. I admire them because I wouldn't last 10 minutes doing what they do. And um, it, it's, it's a rough job. But I'm going to try to start doing that. And whoever I'm talking to, you know what? You're right. That... They're not doing a good job. Let's pray for them right now. That God would lead them and bless them. And, and <laughs> some people might say, "Yeah," and other people might, "Hey, whoa, go on <laughs> Yeah, I'm just creating awareness. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, gossip is these days. Creating awareness. Well, I want to. Do we have any? You doing your class today? You want class today? Now? <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting sometime? We have all the adults go to class and the kids stay in here. Yeah. Some of the kids, I've been good. Why would you do that to me? <laughs> well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. Your word is alive and active. Your word does amazing things. It is at your word you spoke and what you said came into being. So Lord, we invite you to speak your word over us today. Because Lord, your word is creative. Your word divides our thoughts from your thoughts. Cuts right to the point of things. And so Lord, as we look to your word today, we invite you to speak it over us. Bless us, Lord, as we look to your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to mix things up a little bit, so whatever is set up there is not what we're going to be looking at today. Oh, so. cool. I know, some of you, it's throwing you all off. We'll see how it goes. We're going to look at uh, some verses in Matthew 24 today instead. But uh, I called today, how to navigate when things go wrong. I don't know, I kind of feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, because you all have endured the most horrific things, and yet here you are. So, um, But every now and then, i got to think back, how did I get through that time? And then I shake my head and say, just by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Because, that, I mean, I bet there's a whole bunch of you who can think about, yeah, I stood on the edge of the abyss and saw total destruction, and only by the grace of God I didn't fall in. Yeah, so, how do you navigate when things go wrong? How do you even know when things are going wrong? Sometimes they're going right, but it looks wrong, and, and you're like, yeah. You know, you ever grieved a breakup, and now you're like, thank you, Jesus, that was, that was all bad, you know? How do you figure out the right way to respond and deal with when difficulty comes? Because let's face it, somebody told me once, when a fire breaks out, it's like you've got a bucket of water and a bucket of gasoline. Which one are you going to throw on it? Some people live to throw gasoline on the fire. <laughs> you know, it's just what they do. So you can always choose the right way or the wrong way to respond when difficulty hits and when trouble comes. Matter of fact, how do you define things going wrong? Usually we define it as when we suffer some kind of loss. That, that's usually what people think when, uh, when things have gone wrong. I mean, nobody walked out despondent when the boss said, I'm giving you a $100 raise, <laughs> right? But if they say, times are tough, we're going to cut your pay, that's when you hit crisis because... Um, what was it, last year or the year before when the governor said we're in a budget crisis so everybody who works for the state is taking a 10% cut in pay? Mm -hmm. Except for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go over well. But uh, how do you deal with it when you maybe you think you're suffering loss? <laughs> because, I mean, there are things like, I mean, Rosa suffered the loss of over 40 pounds. She's not grieving. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> it's not a it's not a crisis. So, not all loss is suffering. So how do we how do we identify? How do we measure? And how do we navigate when we go through difficult times? And we usually don't see the difficult times coming, right? I mean, nobody had a guess of what would happen in 2020. We had all kinds of plans, and, and I remember sitting in a pastor's meeting, and they said, you know this one church in the Bay Area? They said this could go on for six weeks. We're like, six weeks? Are you kidding? How would we deal with this shutdown for six weeks? Now we're like, oh, six weeks would have been nice. Of course, we always want to look to Jesus. Because Jesus was fully God, fully human. I mean, he, if he got poked, he felt the pain, right? This wasn't, he didn't just float slightly above the ground and, and not experience what you and I experience. He experienced suffering and, and difficulty and, and threats. So it's good to look to him and look at, okay, what are we supposed to do? Now, I don't know about you, but people all the time these days are asking me about end time stuff. Ask me about, you know, what does Revelation say? And they think it's only in Revelation Jesus talked about stuff. Like in Matthew 24, and Paul talked in First and Second Thessalonians about what the end days would, would look like. And they actually, you know, they're all the same because they come from the same author, the Holy Spirit. But let's look at verses uh, 1 through 14. And the disciples think they're asking Jesus making a simple comment or asking a simple question, and then Jesus responds in a way that kind of freaks them out, so they ask some follow-up questions. In Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14, it says this, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Oh, there's a first clue. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, we're just going to stop there, but really, Jesus continues on talking about this through all of chapter 24 and all of chapter 25. There are parables that he tells in chapter 25 that address directly how we are to live in anticipation of these things. Now, there's a lot of people who freak out about this, and they don't like to talk about it because it sounds like they may lose all their stuff. <laughs> Believe me, if Jesus wants to take you home to be with him, you're going to thank God that you don't have to worry about all the stuff. But the disciples did not see this coming. They're like, wow, Jesus, isn't that temple magnificent? And Jesus said, yeah, but you know what? A day's coming, not one stone's going to be left on another. And they're like, oh, when's that going to happen? And and then they include a couple more questions. And what's going to be the sign of, of your coming again? And Jesus lays it out. 
So there's a, a few things I thought that would be very helpful because they're a little freaked out at this point. They're like, wow, how could things turn so bad that even the temple is destroyed? Because if the temple's destroyed, then there's other bad stuff going on. You know, when you read in Revelation, it sounds like things get really, really evil. Probably things will turn the most evil when Jesus pulls his people out of it. Because if everybody who has a love for God and a love for his neighbor is removed from the situation, that's when literally all hell breaks loose. Because there's nothing to hold it back. So let's draw out a few things that Jesus told them to do. First of all, in verse 4, he said, don't let anyone deceive you. With social media, it's so much easier to deceive people. I mean, some people make their living deceiving people. It's like, you have a reward from AT&T. Click here to redeem it. Yeah. No. at and is not rewarding you. <laughs> so how do you not let people deceive you? Because there's all kinds of crazy teaching out there. And usually they have something that sounds biblical, but isn't quite. And you know what they're depending on? You not being familiar with the Bible. Some of it sounds really good, but then you hit something you're like, that's not right. right. That, that doesn't sound right. But they prey on people who dabble in Jesus a little bit, but don't actually want to take the time and see what he says. And Lord knows, you can find a bad example of everybody, right? You can't just say, oh, look, See that preacher? Look at what he did. It's all fake. There's nothing to it. Really? One person represents an entire population? We could disqualify everybody's race, everybody's gender, everybody's nationality. Because there's a bad example because people are messy. And they're scoundrels in every people group. So we can't just write people off and you don't want to join in with people who write everybody off. Amen. So to keep yourself from being deceived, first you need to know God's word. That's why we talk all the time about reading your Bible. Well, that's one of the reasons. Another reason is because God speaks to you. The God who created the heavens and the earth wants to talk to you personally. And one of the ways he does that is through his word. But when you fill yourself with the word of God, then you can spot the lies. Some people, they're like, yeah, doesn't the Bible say God helps those who help themselves? I'm like, no, that was Ben Franklin. <laughs> but, uh, Actually, the Bible says God helps those who can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. And he's probably wanting to use you to do it. So know God's word. It's how you can spot the lies quickly. And then second, understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not angry. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, the Holy Spirit brings peace. And, and some people, they think they're very godly when they scold other people and threaten them in the name of Jesus. You better change your life or God will send you straight to hell. It's like, if I have to listen to you, I'm already there. <laughs> you know, Somebody, I, I was in, uh, in Starbucks one time in my police chaplain uniform and an older couple came up and said, oh, what do you do as a chaplain? I, I volunteer in the school and they get the scowl. Do you tell these kids that if they don't stay behaved, they'll wind up in prison? <laughs> like, they already know that. They just don't know there's a second option. So I go there to offer them hope. Understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit's like? Read Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is what it's commonly called. Because if the Holy Spirit is working in you... This is how it comes through. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what the Holy Spirit is like. So, if somebody claims they are speaking in the name of God, and they are the opposite of that, no, they are a modern version of the Pharisees. If they're hateful, spiteful, judgmental. And when you fill yourself with the word of God, you see where, some people are like, oh, so we never 
say anything to anybody that will make them feel bad. Are you kidding? Jesus said stuff every day that made people feel bad. Because it's like, yeah, if you don't change, you are going to be destroyed. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> it's because he loves you and wants to steer you clear. Any of you have had an intervention with an addict? Know what this is like. You said stuff that made them feel bad because you loved them and didn't want them to die. That is loving. But you didn't growl at them, you didn't scold them, you didn't threaten them. You said, you know I love you, and it kills me to see what you are doing to yourself. You need to change or I just can't be around you anymore because you're breaking my heart. That, that's love motivated. That's not self-righteous speaking. That's not arrogance and anger. That's a spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. The Holy Spirit will never contradict, contradict his nature or God's word. So, understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. And then third, believe that God's word is true. I mean, I, I've met people, they have the Bible on a stand in their living room, they never open it, they have no idea what's in it, but they've got a Bible, like, <laughs> I have a cough, ooh, 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 okay, I feel better. <laughs> it's their good luck charm or their talisman. No, read it, that's why it's there. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Jesus even told the Pharisees, you search the Scriptures believing they have the words of life, but the Scriptures point to me and you refuse to believe me. They missed the entire point. Believe that God's word is true. And I don't know about you, but I know there were times in my life where I'm like, okay, Lord, if this isn't true, this is really going to mess me up. And so I'm trusting that you said what you said is true. So here we go. And then you find it true. Because otherwise, what's the other option? Stay at home, lock the doors, play it safe, and wither away. But to actually step out and do the things that God said in his word that we should do? That's when you're walking and living in God's word. And that, that's going to help you navigate the difficult times that come. Because no one, none of us like it when we're attacked. None of us like it when people trash talk us. It's not a pleasant thing. If it was, then we would naturally do what Jesus called us to do. But instead he said things like, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. And that doesn't come naturally. And Jesus isn't saying, if you're nice enough, it'll spread. No, if you're nice enough, they'll eat you. That's <laughs> kind of how it works. It wouldn't work if God were not in the mix. But what we do is we bless those who curse us and we stand back and let God intervene on our behalf. That's what he's calling us to do. But if you don't believe God's word is true, you are never going to step out in faith and see God act in your life. When you make it a habit of believing God's word is true, then you're not going to let anyone deceive you. So don't let anyone deceive you. In verse 6, Jesus said, See that you are not troubled or alarmed. The whole world right now is stacked against you, desperately trying to make you troubled or alarmed. I mean, how does the rancher get the sheep into the pen, right? He has dogs that run the perimeter and bark at them to get them to go where they want to go. Today we have the media <laughs> to do that, to bark at you and threaten you to get you to where they want you to go and get you corralled. I mean, it was recently exposed that the algorithms that Facebook has is designed to make you afraid and angry. It is specifically designed for that. So if social media makes you afraid or angry, know that they have achieved their purposes for your life. Because if you can control how people think, you can control the population. And that's what social media and the media is doing right now. See to it that you are not alarmed or troubled. They don't post the headlines of what Jesus is doing in our world today. They don't talk about the amazing things that God is doing. 
So one of the things you need to do is trust in God's love and mercy. If you're reading his word, you're believing his word, and he says things like, nothing can separate you from the love of God, then hopefully you just decide in your head, okay, nothing can separate me from the love of God. So then when difficulty happens, or you're faced with a hard decision, the devil's going to say, God's not going to show you the way because you thought a bad thought yesterday. You haven't done your five days probationary period with God or whatever other crazy arguments come in our head. No, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We need to trust in his love and trust in his mercy. I talked to one guy and he was always troubled about what was going on in other parts of the world. What about these people in that country? Why are they going through that? I said, I don't know, I'm not there. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Is God powerful enough to help them? Yeah. Does God love them more than you do? Yeah. Okay, so trust Him. See, their story with God is their story, and your story with God is your story. And I guarantee you, most everybody here has a story where if somebody heard it, their first thing would say, how could God let you go through something like that? And yet, here you are singing, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his love endures forever. Because you have experienced that. Trust in God's love and mercy. Any of you have... I could catalog all the things the devil whispers in my ear. Of course, he uses your own voice, so you don't recognize who the author is, or you'd write him off immediately. But he says, well, yeah, God delivered you, you know, last year, but you were more on the ball last year. <laughs> this year, you've been kind of flaky, and so... He's going to let you fall to teach you a lesson. Yeah. Trust God with what's going on. God is not shocked and surprised by your situation. I mean, if your boss walked in tomorrow and said, uh, we have cuts, we're going to have to let you go. We're laying you off. God's not up there going, oh man, I didn't see that coming. I would have had something set up. No. God knew it was coming. And if you trust in the love of God, then you're like, okay, well, let's see what the Lord has next. Because I know he will not abandon me. Let me ask you this. Does Jesus love the Christians in Afghanistan more than you do? Yes, he does. So we need to trust him with what's going on. Trust in his love and faithfulness toward you no matter what is going on. So then, yeah, we pray for them. But we can't let these things eat at us all day, every day. Because when it does, then what we're saying is, Lord, I wish you did something, but I doubt you will. If we're fearful all the time, usually it means all we're thinking about is ourselves. Rather than looking out for somebody else. I, I tell people sometimes, I said, you know, it's amazing what happens when our God's feeding hands group goes out. When they're out feeding the homeless and praying for them, none of them are looking at porn. None of them are drinking or gambling. None of them are yelling at their neighbors. See, when you do what Jesus calls you to do, many times you just don't have time for all the nonsense. It's not about sitting home trying really hard to be good. Really, you're just trying really hard not to be bad. We need to trust in God's love and mercy. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then in chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Every now and then I, I share a, a thought with you all. You tell me about something awful you're going through, and, and I'll say, how awful would it be to go through this without Jesus? And when people think about that, it kind of changes their level of misery, right? It helps draw them out of it. And you know what? It helps them start looking outward like, who is going through this that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't have the hope 
that we have. Because remember the Apostle Paul? He was always getting beat up and arrested. And he's like, I don't know if they're going to let me go or if they're going to execute me. They haven't told me which way it's going to go. If they let me go, I get to spread the gospel among more people. If they execute me, I'm done. I get to live in the presence of my Savior Jesus. It's a win-win. So, bring it on, whatever you want to do, because I'm excited either way. He's not troubled. He's not despondent. But he also believes everything God says. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling the disciples there in John 14, 15, 16, I'm going to be leaving. And they're like, are we done here? <laughs> How... That doesn't sound like a good thing because we left everything to follow you. And then he, he dies on the cross, but he's raised from the dead and appears to them. And he says, just hang out in Jerusalem until you receive power. And they're like, okay. They have no idea what that looks like. They don't know what to do. Ten days, they're gathering and praying and saying, you feel any tingling in your fingertips? No. You know, they don't know what it's going to look like. And then the Holy Spirit comes on them. They did not grieve any loss. But they were filled with a whole new power and boldness and confidence in Christ that they had never experienced before. Because with Jesus, it's always win-win. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 5, Peter and John were arrested by the religious leaders for preaching about Jesus. In uh, verses 40 and 41, it says, They called the apostles in and had them flogged. I don't think anybody here has had their shirt pulled up and they were whipped 39 times across the back. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. It says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And the religious leaders are like, now what do we do? We beat them, and they're like, just like my Lord, I can't believe I get to be so closely associated with Him that what He said we would go through, I got to experience. Were they troubled by the situation? Did they say, God, I, I've been doing everything You said. Why would You let me get hurt? No. Did they question whether or not God loved them? No. So He says, see that you are not troubled or alarmed, by what is going on around you. Because I got to tell you, there's no better time to tell people about Jesus because people are a little freaked out these days. Trust in God's love and mercy and that God knows what He's doing. The third thing He tells us here in Matthew 24, He says, those who endure will be saved. I used to be a little confused about that. It's like, uh, didn't you just say some will be killed? For following him? How can you be killed but endure? He's talking about, and scripture talks about a great falling away. There will be a time when people will walk away from the faith. When they're like, no, nah, I'm not going to church. It's too risky now. You know, during the height of the shutdown, churches that were open in the Bay Area, neighbors went out with their cell phones and recorded people coming out of the church. So if they weren't six feet apart or wearing a mask, they could alert the authorities. We still have it pretty light. That people are still being executed in other parts of the world for being followers of Jesus. So, we've still got it pretty easy. But what does that mean, those who endure will be saved? How do we do that? Well, first of all, don't do what he says in verses 10 through 12 which says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. I think we're seeing that right now, the love of most growing cold. Uh, I was talking to one woman, and she had a childhood friend. They've been friends since they were six years old. They vacationed every year together. They, their kids called each other auntie. And then when her friend found out she voted for Trump, she has nothing to do with her ever since. Really? 
There are many who their love is grown cold. And they think, you can tell how much I care by how much I hate those people. It, it's that lie that I've really beaten to death talking about. <laughs> but uh, there's that strain where people believe they are the most righteous because they hate the most. Their life is devoted to finding out who are the victims, who are the villains. I will define them and hate the villains, and that's how you'll know I am righteous. And you can't contain hate to just one area. The love of most will grow cold. Hatred and betrayal is never God's will. It's never God's will. So when people say, oh yes, I am the most faithful to Jesus because I hate those people... They have nothing to do with Jesus. They bought into the lie. Just look at, you, you can look at chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, and see what the followers of Jesus are like. It's that parable of the sheep from the goats. And both of them didn't know they were interacting with Jesus. It's just one group. The love of God was flowing through them towards others. And then there were others who thought, ah, it's their mess, I won't worry about it. Somebody, somebody re responded to our God's feeding hands um, Facebook post saying, ah, when are those homeless going to clean up their messes? <laughs> it's like, well, the city tried giving him trash bins, but all these other freeloading citizens backed up their truck and dumped their mattresses and tires and flat screen TVs and filled them up. So the homeless couldn't do it. And the city tried to provide porta potties to the homeless and uh, other people, oh, you're just encouraging them to be in our neighborhood. So they burned them down. So, yeah, they are literally adding insult to injury. So, yeah, it's not the homeless that are creating the messes. So, yeah, take a good look at <laughs> Matthew 25, 31 through 46 later and see what God says about that. But Jesus said, so if anyone tells you he is out there in the wilderness, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. And if you read further, Jesus talks about things happening in the heavens, the sun going dark and the stars being shaken and falling from the sky. People will freak out because they're like, we're all going to die soon. He tells the believers, stand up and look because your deliverance is coming. So if everything goes dark and then Jesus is coming, he will be the only light. Amen. And people will freak out like, oh, that's the guy I've been fighting against all this time. They'll just know. Or, you see, I, I like to use the example, the good kid and the bad kid when dad gets home. <laughs> One's excited, ooh, daddy, and the other's like, I'm going to get whooped, <laughs> you know, right? Same dad, same situation, just depends on the nature of your relationship, how you've been doing. So, don't fall away, hang in there. And second, just don't give up. I, I meet people all the time who are giving up. I, I'd like to follow Jesus, but life is just so hard. Yeah. And you're giving up on Jesus, the one guy who's going to get you through it? I, I heard somebody one time, they're like, they literally said, I'm just tired of trying to be good. Okay, why don't you try Jesus instead of trying to just be good? Because, yeah, it's hard to indulge in goodness if you're not a good person. It doesn't last very long. Don't give up. Don't give up on God. He will be there for you. And third, don't think you can fix your relationship with God later. I've talked to so many people who have a family member who suddenly died, and then all of a sudden they're like, I wish I would have told them I loved them. I wish I would have spent more time with them. I wish I would have done this, that, or the other thing. Because, yeah, none of us know what tomorrow holds. One of the biggest traumas of COVID is people whose loved ones went in the hospital and they never got to see them or say a word to them again. And their loved one died. Even the nurses said that's 
some of the most traumatic part. Having to tell families, no, you can't come say goodbye to your dying loved one. And I talked to a couple of people who have a nurse in their family, and they said, yeah, they budgeted an hour before or after their shift just to cry. So Jesus, if you're familiar with this word, I mean, if somebody said, you know what, they're... I think Jesus has come back. He's in Las Vegas. He's doing amazing things. He's doing the miraculous. I really think it's him. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people, ooh, maybe I should go look. What did he say? No. He's going to be coming across the sky. The way he comes is going to be very different. So you need, again, be familiar with his word. But don't think you can fix your relationship with God later. I think I shared last week or the week before about the young man who lived on uh, Oak Street who um, accepted an invitation to go to a local church when they were handing out flyers. He came to church and God just really cut through to his heart and he went to the front and he surrendered his life to Jesus. And the next Saturday night he was gunned down in a drive-by. Scripture says that God does not delight in the death of anyone but wishes all would be saved. And that includes you. You don't want to sit around saying, someday I'll do what Jesus says. How, how well does that go at work? Someday I'll do what the boss says, but right now I'm just not feeling it. Yeah, you're not going to be feeling it all right. So don't think you can fix your relationship with God later. Jesus said in verse 33, Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. When he says nation against nation, actually the Greek word there is ethnos against ethnos. Has there been a great rise in ethnic violence? Worldwide, there has been. There's also something interesting happening that you don't see in the news. There is a global mistrust of those in authority. It's happening all over the world not just here in the United States. And Jesus talks about a time of lawlessness where the, the lines of definition are being erased. And there's a, a trend right now in our society and actually worldwide to just erase any line that, that defines anything. There are people right now who are saying the Constitution's old, it was just a bunch of oppressive white guys, we should just do away with the Constitution. In other words, enter a time of lawlessness, justifying whatever you want and then taking it. Jesus told us about these things. But if we trust in his love for us, we don't need to freak out. So, what is God's ultimate desire for you? A lot of people think God is up there and he's just got like a holy cattle prod. And every time you step off the path, he's absolutely, ah, sorry, you know. Trouble is the path isn't always well marked. Uh, I think the Lord wants me to go this way. Psh, ah! <laughs> no. God's ultimate desire for you is to be in a love relationship with you. That is God's ultimate desire. It's why you were born in the first place. Because God wanted you to be born. You, you talk to any young couple who has their first baby... Why are you having a child now? Well, I thought it would financially be high. Well, no, those things just cost. They don't, they don't bring, generate any income at all. <laughs> you just, well, you know, I, there's chores around here, and I need chores done. You haven't seen mess till you have a baby. <laughs> and nobody else is coming in to clean it up for you. <laughs> I mean, I cleaned up stuff for my boys. I wouldn't touch out of somebody else's kid. <laughs> And yet we delight in them, and we would die for them. And we are fascinated with them. And we see them as a precious gift from God. God didn't create you to do chores. God didn't create you so you could do your best to walk the straight path and impress Him. God created you because He loves you. He wanted you to be born. He wanted you to be in relationship with Him. And when you're in relationship with Him, His perfect love will drive out all fear. Now, every now and then I hear people, it's, it's amazing. It's like, you want to know somebody's stance on the COVID vaccine? Just ask what political party they are. <laughs> that pretty much lines up the COVID vaccine, which means both sides ignore the science. They're just in it for the politics. 
<laughs> and, and they say, well, I just believe God will protect me, and so I don't need the vaccine. It's like, you lock your door at night? <laughs> yeah. You don't think God can protect you from adverse reaction from the vaccine? <laughs> yeah. Don't give me that faith business, because they're just using God words to justify their political position. And it's done on both sides of the issue. Your interest needs to be in walking with Jesus. Because that's what he created you for. He loves you deeply. And you ever been with your mom or your dad and somebody popped off to one of them and you thought, ooh, this will be good. <laughs> right? Because nobody gives them garbage. <laughs> and uh, perfect love drives out all fear. Walking with your heavenly daddy every day, what is going to come against you then? Who can separate you from the love of God? God's ultimate desire is to be in a love relationship with you. It's not about the tasks that he gives you. It's about being bound to Jesus and filled with his Holy Spirit. And when you do tasks with Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm going to do this. It's going to be awesome. Why don't you come with me? It's not holy chores. It's not that you have to, it's that you get to walk with him. It, it cracks me up. Like, again, God's feeding hands. People come back and they're like, it's just amazing how God is with us when we go out and we pray with the homeless. And other people are like, yeah, I think you're just rationalizing the misery. <laughs> but, uh, no, I can't. I talked to two ladies who don't go to our church and one of them says, when you have your homeless banquet, let me know the date so I can come because I'm never around the homeless and I think it's amazing what you do and I want to help. And the other lady said, yeah, please let me know when the date is so I can pray for her while she goes and meets with the homeless because I'm not going. <laughs> because they don't think God is in the mix. They think it's, she thinks you're trying to be a good person to impress God for cash and prizes. It's about being bound to Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he can easily walk you through the troubling times. When you know he loves you and he's not punishing you because of some sin you might have accidentally done a month ago, you put that out of your head and you're like, Jesus, I know you know my situation, so what do you want to do? And many times our time of prayer is not convincing him it's letting him adjust our point of view so we can see where he wants to take us. It's adjusting our eyes to his light. And it'll help you navigate when it looks like things have gone very wrong. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, because we live in a fallen and broken world... There are always troubles. Lord Jesus, you flat out told the disciples, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Lord, when we walk with you, when we know that your Holy Spirit dwells in us, when we've surrendered our lives into your hands, Lord, then really we belong to you. Scripture says we have given ourselves over as slaves to Jesus. And so anything anybody throws at us is your problem, not ours, because we belong to you. Just like if we're at work, Lord, and something breaks, then the boss has a problem. That's not my problem. I'm just working for the boss. So, Lord, help us keep that kingdom mindset that if we have surrendered our lives into your hands, then any difficulty that comes into our lives are your problem not ours, so we just need to look to you at how to take our next step. And Lord, we can do it with confidence knowing that your love endures forever. And you are never shocked or surprised by our situation. And your love sustains us. And so Lord, we will walk in confidence that your love endures forever. That you are out to do us good. And when we do a misstep, usually you don't need to punish us. We wind up punishing ourselves a whole lot. 
But Lord, you love us. You want to be in a close relationship with us. You want to get rid of everything that would drive a wedge between us and you, which is why you tell us to confess our sins to you, because then we got nothing to hide, and that won't become a barrier that makes us hide from you anymore. Lord, you are good, and you are out to do us good. And so, Lord, expose the lies. Recall to our mind the the scripture verses that we've taken in when the devil tries to lie to us so that it will be exposed and we'll know the truth and be set free. Lord, don't let us be troubled by what's going on around us, but continue to lead us to walk with you to where we can be part of the solution for the people around us. And Lord, instill in us the endurance to not give up. Because, Lord, you are good, and you are always good, and you are always out to do us good. And, Lord, when we're going through a hardship, many times we need to get around some other people going through disaster to put our inconveniences into perspective. Because if our eyes are on ourselves, we will always find problems to fuss about. But Lord Jesus, we want to fix our eyes on you, so we invite you to distract us and fascinate us with yourself. Glorify yourself in our eyes, that we may live and breathe you all the days of our lives. And all the troubles of our world will begin to fade. Lord, it's the kind of life you've called us to, a life of peace peace and joy if we'll just walk with you and trust you in all things. And so, Lord, we choose to do that. And Lord, right now I ask that you would expose the lies that are trying to strike fear and discouragement in the hearts of each person here. Lord, I ask that you would reveal yourself in a very real way in the hearts and minds of the people here, that they would have a fresh and new understanding of how deep your love is for them. And Lord, thank you that you never give up on us but you are relentless in your pursuit and your love for us. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done yes, in the hearts and minds of each person here today, just like it has done before your throne in heaven. And then, Lord, we will marvel at where you take us. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us today and for calling us to walk with you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We're going to sing How Great Is Our God because he is worthy of us singing How Great Is Our God. And I hope as difficulty hits you, let it pique your curiosity. Wow, Lord, how are you going to handle this one? This ought to be good. And see where he takes you. If you can, please stand and let's